So Isaac Newton came up with three laws that describe how motion works. We're going to take some time to understand each of these three laws. Now Newton's first law says that an object moves with constant velocity unless a non-zero net force acts on it. Another way of saying this that you might have heard before is objects at rest stay at rest and objects in motion continue in their constant motion unless there's a force acting on them. So let's think about what this means, maybe with a few examples. Newton's first law is saying that motion only changes when there's a net force on an object. So if you have an object that's stationary, it's not going to suddenly start moving. If you have a book sitting on a table, it would be pretty weird if that book just suddenly started sliding across the table. If it did, then you would expect that there must be some sort of force pushing it across the table. Now, you can have a situation where um, an object's moving at a constant velocity and continues to do so essentially forever. That's like if you have an object in um, space. Maybe you have a spacecraft or a, an asteroid and it's far away from planets or stars. That spacecraft is going to continue moving in a straight line at constant speed because there's no forces pushing on it. It won't slow down. So interestingly, for a long time, uh, people thought that the natural tendency of objects was always to slow down. This came from ancient Greek scientists like Aristotle, who said that if you, for instance, roll a ball across the floor, the natural tendency is for the ball to eventually slow down and stop, which of course is what happens in everyday life. But Newton came along and said, well, the reason why the ball slows down and stops is because there's a force pushing on it. There's a friction force. If you could eliminate all forces, if you could eliminate all friction, then that ball wouldn't ever stop rolling. It would keep moving at the same speed. It wouldn't slow down. Maybe you've played um, air hockey at an arcade. In air hockey, there's a table that uh, shoots up air so that the puck can slide on that table with very little friction. You notice that that air hockey puck can slide around for a long time without slowing down. The idea of that is to try to eliminate as much friction as possible. It's not perfect, eventually it does slow down. But that's the idea. Now keep in mind that velocity is a vector. So turning also indicates a change in velocity. Objects are not going to turn unless there is a force acting on them. So uh, again, if you have an air hockey puck or an asteroid in space, it's gonna continue at constant speed in a straight line. If you see it turning, you see its direction change, that's an indication that there must be a force acting on it. Think about when you're in a car and you're driving along and then you go around and turn. You'll probably find, let's say, uh, let's say I'm driving forward and I turn to my left, what I feel is that it seems like I am sliding to the right in the car as I turn to the left. The reason why is because my natural tendency, my Newton's first law tendency, is to keep going in a straight line at constant speed. Meanwhile, the car is starting to go to the left. So relative to the car, 
I'm kind of sliding to the right. I'm not actually moving to the right. I'm continuing to go forward, but the car is going to the left. So relative to the car, it seems like I'm going to the right. <clears throat> All right. Now, we also need to develop the ideas of inertia and mass to uh, continue understanding Newton's laws. Newton's first law sometimes is known as the law of inertia. And inertia is the property of an object that resists a change in its velocity. The more inertia an object has, the more difficult it is to change its velocity. An object with a large inertia is hard to speed up or slow down, and it's hard to turn. Now the last concept we need to develop in this lecture is the concept of mass. Mass is a little more subtle than you probably thought, because you can think of mass in three ways. Uh, the first way, which is kind of the chemistry way, is just saying mass is the amount of substance you have. And you're probably used to thinking of mass like that. The second interpretation of mass is that it is the measure of an object's inertia. The more mass an object has, the greater its inertia. Um, if you have a, a train that weighs many, many tons, thousands of tons, that train has a lot of inertia. And if you want to stop that train, that requires a lot of force to stop it. Changing that train's velocity is very difficult. On the other hand, if there's a, a bicycle and you want to change that bicycle's velocity, if you want to stop a bicycle, it doesn't require nearly as much force to do that because a bicycle has much less inertia, much less mass than a train does. The third interpretation of mass is that it's the property of matter that interacts with gravity. So just like electric charge is the property of matter that causes the electric force, mass is the property of matter that causes the gravitational force. So you could think of mass as being like the gravitational charge. Now, um, electric charges come in plus and minus. You probably know that from chemistry. Gravitational charge, or mass, is only plus. As far as we know, there's no such thing as negative mass. So gravity is only an attractive force. It never repels, unlike electric or magnetic forces that could either attract or repel. So mass has three interpretations, amount of substance, inertia, and gravitational charge. Okay, now that we've got this terminology, we can start understanding Newton's second law. 